Minnesota. Oh, they're tooting their horn. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, here he is. My brothers and sisters in the car out there. Hey, I am sorry. We were going to watch a video of this. We're going to watch a short video. Josh Tokar sent us a short video uh, of uh, Jesus sharing. Uh, he went through a week of treatment. Uh, he's pretty tired a week from that, but he's going to share. He's sharing a short video, just a couple minutes, and then we're continuing our uh, on our service here. So uh, that's what's going on. And so hang with us. Hang with us, and we'll be back just in a second. Um, overall, uh, chemotherapy, um, to start, I would record this video here, um, to let you know how things are going. Um, it's hard to tell, um, how I feel from day to day, so I thought a video might be better. Um, overall, uh, chemotherapy is, I would say, going well. Um, it's not as bad, I guess, so far as the this horror story expectations that I thought it would be. Um, but some things maybe are a little worse than I thought. Uh, I have much more tired, weak feeling than I thought I would at this point. Um, so I just continue to pray and ask him to pray with me. That God give me strength to get through. Um, I've gone through two weeks now of chemotherapy and go in one day next week. After that, start the next cycle again with five days in a row. And I um, have to do that for three cycles. So appreciate your continued prayers for us. Um, Sienna's doing well. She's been a great nurse for me and great, doing a great job taking care of me. Uh, boys are having a fun summer. Enjoying their freedom, and um, that's been really good. <coughs> so our future in Ukraine remains kind of uncertain, especially with all of this, and not to mention coronavirus and other factors. But um, we continue just to keep moving ahead day by day. Uh, God is in control. We know that, and we um, continue to pray that God would uh, allow us to go back here soon to Ukraine. Uh, I know for myself, uh, I talked to the doctor, uh, and so I probably won't be able to go back until sometime in October. Uh, we're still looking at whether the see the kids might be able to return earlier than that, but um, at this point we're not sure. Appreciate your continued prayers, your support, your encouragement. Um, they sure mean a lot, and they've been very helpful. And um, of course, your financial support. Uh, blessings to each of you, and uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon. Uh, just thought I would record this video here um, to let you know how things are going. Um, it's hard to... So that was from Josh. He's doing, he's really tired, but uh, the treatment's going well for him. And uh, so we are, um, so he's... He said he's going to go back in one day next week, and then he has to go back in for another five days of treatment. So be praying for Josh. So th uh, just hopefully, are my people in the car, They are. You, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Awesome. So we're looking, we're in uh, First Peter this morning, but don't turn to First Peter, turn to Revelation. We're going to start with Re the book of Revelation today. Uh, in your... In your uh, bulletin you should have my handout um we're going to start with revelation chapter one the last book of the bible hopefully you brought your bibles if not maybe you have it on your phone uh revelation chapter one this is you know this is talking about uh, the coming of christ uh, we look forward to that i'm going to be talking about that this morning a little bit and uh, along with other things so so in revelation chapter one Let me just, um, I'm going to read this first chapter, but I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just part of it. So this is, uh, <clears throat> we've been talking, uh, in, in First Peter, we've been talking about 
Uh, he talks about the living hope, the hope that we have in Christ and Christ's return. And we look forward to that day when Christ comes back. It is one of the pillars of our, uh, you know, the, the, the pr- prophetic word. We think that, that Christ will be coming back soon. Uh, it's interesting, First Peter, we talked about that last week. Uh, First Peter, we talked about how that uh, Peter, when he, when he spoke at Pentecost, he didn't realize that the, he didn't realize that the time of, gen, of the Gentiles would go on for 2,000 years. So he thought that the, the coming of Christ would be imminent. And uh, we still feel that. We don't know when it will be. Uh, but, uh, you know, it could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. Uh, I just think it's interesting, you know, that Peter was uh, obviously expecting that at any time. Uh, and uh, it's been a few years since uh, since he spoke. So, and he wrote. It actually, when he, uh, I was trying to think probably the time between when he preached at Pentecost and then when he wrote First Peter, I don't know, maybe it's 20 years, maybe it's 25 years. And then right before he passed away, he wrote Second Peter. And I don't know the time between First and Second Peter. Just off the top of my head, I'm not sure what the time frame on that was. But anyway, so we're looking at First Peter, but it's, it's a great, this is a great passage. So in Revelation, we're in Revelation right now. This is our, t- our title, First Peter. He's talking a lot about Christ's return in this first chapter, First Peter. And we're in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show the servants what must soon take place. He made known <clears throat> by sending his servant to his servant John who testified to everything he saw. I think my glasses on. Sorry. I have giant print in my Bible, but sometimes it's still quite not enough. He testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is, who, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. I love that little verse. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It says, look, it says, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. He says, I am Alpha, oh, sorry, before that says, so shall it be. Amen. So shall it be, amen, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, <clears throat> who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And then it goes on, you know, then he, he has this vision and he writes the, he writes the book of Revelation. Uh, in verse 17, I love this, it says, he talks about seeing Jesus. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, verse, this is 117, as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and, and ever. And, hold, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Great verses. Now turn back with me a couple of books to First um, Peter. Just let me go to First Peter chapter, three, chapter 1 verse 3. This is a passage we've been working through. Uh, we've been talking about glory that we're gonna that God is preparing us for glory, and someday we are going to be changed. We're going to be given new bodies. Uh, we're going to be glorified. That's what He promises. He says in His Word that we're going to be changed. And salvation, you know, uh, He begins when we come to Christ. He begins in our spirit to change us, and then He begins in our soul. We call that sanctification. But eventually, our very bodies will be changed. And uh, I just love the, the, you know, so he's referencing this in First Peter. He says, praise, this is uh, First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by the God's power, 
until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come <clears throat> so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Now, here's our passage that I want to key in on today. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's talking specifically of his coming back when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy... To be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that our hearts might be open to your Holy Spirit. May you teach us today. Lord, may you fill us with your spirit. May you pour your spirit out upon us today. And we ask, Lord, that, we, that you might give us understanding. And that you, that, that you might give us hope. And great faith, Lord, in what you have for us in the future. We thank you, Lord, that you promised that you would come back. And we have no question about that. We don't doubt that, Lord. We don't know the timing, but we're looking to you, Lord, for the future. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a fulfiller of promises. You keep your promises to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just want to talk this morning, uh, you know, uh, a little bit about uh, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I think it's a great hope. I said preparing for the coming future. And he literally, the verse there is, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Are you ready? You know, if you knew that uh, this afternoon there was going to be a major fire, forest fire come through, came, come through and burn, you know, through this area, would that, would that prompt you to be prepared, you know? Would you have your hose out and your shovel out? I remember when the October, they had an October, it was in October, man, it's been a while back. It's probably been, I lose track of time, probably 15 years ago. So they had this wind that came through and there was lots of fires in the area. And then the, in a couple of weeks, they had another wind. It was just, the wind was just right. It was really dry. And uh, it was interesting because I remember going out in front of my house and looking around and then I could look out to my neighbors and I, you know, I'm, you know, we're on like 10 acres, but there's neighbors around us. I could look out and my neighbors were home and they were out looking. They had their shovels ready. They had their hoses ready. They thought, well, if something happens, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm here. You know, some people were caught, they weren't even home. And some people lost homes in the area because of the fire. So, you know, are you prepared? Are, there, are you prepared for the coming storm? You know, and really, that's really a good question to ask. Uh, I was thinking, you know, this week, I, I said that, you know, um, when you when you think about Jerusalem, you know, and when they destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, there wasn't very many Christians. My understanding, now I'm just speaking from what I've read, uh, but in 70 AD, there wasn't very many Christians in Jerusalem because the church had told them to leave the area. They knew it was going to go down. Uh, there were lots of Jews there, obviously, and uh, the Romans, when they destroyed it, it was a terrible slaughter of, of uh, the Jews uh, by the Romans. Uh, but the thing about it is, you know, the, where, did, where did they go to? So I was thinking, well, where are we going to go? You know, where are we going to flee to? Where, what is we prepare our hearts for the future? So people are, you know, people are leaving Washington State. A lot of people are moving into Idaho. 
you know, and so you could do that. A lot of people are leaving California uh, because of the decisions that are being made in both of those states. And I just think it's interesting, right? Where will we flee to as Christians? Where will we go? Will we go to the mountains? That's kind of what they did. They left and went into the mountains. Uh, will we go to Canada? Uh, I don't know. It's just, a, I just throw the thought out. I just think it's interesting. You know, it, it, you know it, it, if you look at scripture, they never, God never says stay, stay there. Well, he didn't say that. He did say that to the Jews when they were after Nebuchadnezzar. But he didn't say that in general. He says flee, go somewhere else. So where would we flee to? Now, so I just want to, want you to think about that. I think it's interesting to think about that. I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you, by the way. Uh, I grew up on the reservation. I grew up in Inch and Limb on the reservation. I thought, well, I could go back to the res. Now, Jennifer doesn't want to do that, uh, my wife. But I could go to the reservation. Lots of times they won't mess with the reservation. But the reservation, they've kind of closed it to whites. They don't want you to come on the reservation. Right, Sylvia? Yeah, us whiteies, we're out, you know. So uh, though we, uh, though my two brothers and sisters live there, but it's like, you know, they won't let you fish. They won't let you, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, actually. But everybody's protective. I talked to Keith Bickley. He said, you know, they really would, wanted to go this fall uh, back. They've been going as missionaries. They go back and train pastors uh, in the Four Square Church and go to Papua New Guinea and stuff. And he said, right now, Australia, Australia, New Zealand, and I think it's Papua New Guinea and maybe the Fiji Islands that have, a, have a, com a, a compact, and they can travel between those three countries, but they don't want anybody from any other country. They don't want Americans. We've got the COVID. They don't want us packing it in there, right? Now, I think that's kind of funny, actually. Uh, they have a lot of them there. There's, in Europe, they don't want us because we haven't taken care of the COVID either. I'm thinking, okay, whatever, you know. So uh, I've got some thoughts about that, but I'm just going to let that slide. But the point, of, the point I'm trying to say, to say about this is, is that a lot of the countries are closed right now. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to flee to? If things really get bad here, what are you going to do? Now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a warmonger or a fear. You know, I like the media. Every, every negative thing you could possibly think of comes on the TV set, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, it's so depressing. So, but my point is thinking as believers, it says prepare your mind for action. What are you ready to do? What are you ready to do as a believer today? You know, what are you going to do? So that's my, that's my, just for you to kind of think about, mull about. Let me talk about the passage a little bit. So I said, in light of our great salvation, the last, the, the verses I read to you out first Peter is talking about this great salvation. The prophets in the past tried to define the force, tried to help us, like Isaiah 53, uh, David in, uh, you know, in Psalms 22. They gave us some great ideas, and they were trying to put their finger on what was supposed to happen. They knew Christ was going to suffer, but they knew he also was going to have a kingdom, and it was really, they were having a hard time putting that together, but they did their best. It actually says that the angels, I talked about that, even the angels look into this. God never died for the angels. He never saved any angels, you know? They didn't save them, any of them. But the angels that are the good, the good godly angels, they're, they, they watch and they're watching us because God saves us. God has redeemed mankind. God has set us free. So I think it's interesting, but this whole passage is God's great salvation. And then he says, literally says, therefore, therefore, 13, therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ Jesus is revealed. So I said, in light of the great salvation, we need to prepare our minds for action. Christians live in a future tense. Their present actions and decisions are governed by the future hope of Christ coming back, his second coming. I said, genuine hope is a vital spiritual reality. Hope is a Christian's attitude toward the future. In its essence, hope is the equivalent to faith. It is trusting God. Faith involves trusting God in the present, whereas hope is future faith. Trusting God for what is to come. God has been faithful in his promises in the past. He's been faithful in his promises in the present. We can have hope that he's going to fulfill those promises. I said, this is 1A. I said, faith appropriates what God has already said and done in his revealed word. Hope anticipates that he will yet do as promised in Scripture. And then this is A2. Believers owe their hope exclusively to God's graciousness and faithfulness. He provided the perfect salvation in Christ. God has been faithful in the past, is being faithful in the present, 
and will be faithful to all his promises for the future. Therefore, saints can live in a settled hope. We have this not where just I hope it happens. It's a solid hope that says we know it's going to happen because God is the promise keeper. His promises always come true. We have this great hope, and it's a settled hope in our heart that he's going to fulfill all of his promises to us. Paul used the Abraham to illustrate his hope in Romans 4, 16 and 20. Abraham, who is a father of us all, all hoped in God's promise that he would give him a son. And even though it was hope against hope, it was humanly impossible, right, for him to have a son. His faith grew stronger to the glory of God. God is honored when we trust him. And so I just, I want to, you don't have to turn there, but I love that little passage in Romans, uh, Romans 4. He talks about Abraham. Let me just read it to you. Romans 4, 16. Again, you know, it says, it says literally, therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those of those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Now think about that. Most of the time we don't think about that, but Abraham is our father because we're children of the faith. Now Abraham we know was, Abraham was a Gentile before he became a Jew. You knew that, right? And then he became a Jew. So he was the father of the Jews and the father of, their, of, of the law, you know, and those people that come to Christ through the Jewish faith, you know, and, you know, so he's the father of them. He's also the father of the Gentiles, you and I, because he's a father of faith. In faith, we believe in Christ, and he's our father. Now, the people don't really think about that much, but it's true. The other thing is, Abraham, I mentioned this in the first service, Abraham is also the father of Ishmael. And so the Arabs consider Abraham their father. And in fact, it goes on in this passage. He says he's a father of many nations. It says, uh, as it is written, verse 17, Romans 4, 17, as is written, I have made you a father of many nations. So there's many nations that were blessed. How were they blessed? Because of the coming of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're an Arab or a Jew or a Gentile. If you believe in Jesus Christ, he has redeemed you. And he is your father this morning. Interesting, right? I just think it's an interesting thought. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, verse 18, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was a hundred years old, and that Sarah's, womb, that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. There's a picture for us, right? This is why. It was credited to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he, has, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He says, just as Abraham believed God and the promises of a coming son, Isaac, right? And he, was, he could not have a son. It was, it was an impossibility, but he did because God does impossible things. And you, and you say, how could God die for me on the cross? How could Jesus' death save me? And he says, God still does impossible things. If you believe in Jesus, believe that Jesus died for you on the cross. If you identify with what he did, dying for your sins, if you believe that in your heart, you will be born again. Your, the righteousness will be given to you. In fact, it will be credited to you. Nothing that you have done, all that God has done for you. That's the great picture. Now, and, I, and so I, I mentioned this last time. I think it's interesting you know that the chapters and verses in your Bible are not inspired. Now, I believe that this is a word of God inspired. Now, as Christians, as, as um, conservative Bible-believing Christians, we believe that this is the word of God, and it's a, what we state is an original document, right? 
We don't have the original document, but we're really close. 99.99999, really close. I think we're real close to it, but we don't have. In my Bible, I believe everything is written in here, but I, but I need to know this is not the original document. This wasn't, you know, this wasn't the words that Paul wrote. I mean, these are, these are copies from that, all right? I'm just telling you that because, so when I say this, you know, people don't get nervous. So the chapters and verses, the chapters that, you know, you have the next chapter, the next chapter, chapters and verses, they were added about 1,500. They did that so we could read the scriptures, right? I've told you that many times, but sometimes we people forget. So the chapters and verses aren't inspired. So it's interesting, if you go to chapter 5, this is directly related to us. This is Romans 5. So this is the same passage. Therefore, therefore, which means, therefore, what we just read about Abraham and our faith, therefore, chapter 5 is, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All right, there you go. Therefore, because of what Jesus did, if you have faith in Jesus, this belongs to you. You're a child of Abraham. Amazing. All right, that's an example of hope. What kind of hope do you have this morning? Do you have hope for the future? Do you have hope that Jesus is your king and that he promises that he's going to come back? I said believers, this is C, 1C, Believers have an obligation to live in the view of the second coming. In hope, they look forward to the day when Christ will return for his people and then to reward, to then and when he does, to reward and glorify them. And I put a couple of verses, you know, uh, you should read Titus 2, 11 through 14, the whole section. But it says, for the grace of God brings salvation, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. While we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then uh, I read the passage from uh, Revelation 1 to you to begin with. The phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ, Re revelation means a, he re he's revealing himself to us, right? Is the exact phrase that opens the book of Revelation, which unfolds the future culmination of redemptive history. Jesus Christ is coming back. Look, it says, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will, will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now you think about that. 200 years ago when somebody read that, they're thinking, how in all the world, how could everybody see Jesus return? How is that possible? Well, now we have the internet. Now we have TV. That wasn't even possible. Think about it. Every eye will see him. They'll show him on CNN. They'll show him on Fox News. They'll even show him on 2, 4, and 6, right? I'm just saying. Because you know your reason. How is that possible? Well, they didn't. Peter didn't know they had TV back then. Peter would probably say, really? Yeah, you watch, you know, you can watch, it, you can watch the news. All right. I just think it's really interesting. Secondly, Peter tells his readers to prepare their minds for action. Prepare literally means to gird up. It's an interesting word. It, re it refers to tightening the belt, cinching up a cord or rope, or tying something down in preparation for certain action. On the next page it says, in ancient times, people would take, up their, they'd take their robes up, because men wore skirts then. There was, I was trying to think it was a Scythian. Some of one of the nations wore pants, but a lot of them wore skirts. They'd pull our skirts up and they'd stick them in their belts so they could run, run faster, right? And get ready to go. So they'd pick up their skirts, put them in their belt, and they'd be ready to tie them up and they'd be ready to run. If a person wanted to move quickly and easily, this is A on the back page. If a person wanted to move easily, quickly or easily, Often he would pull the corners of his robe up through the belt or sash to tie those corners in place. Peter's picture applies this process to the mind. He urges believers to pull in all the loose ends of their lives, meaning to discipline their, their thoughts, right? And so you want to pull up the loose ends of what's going on in your mind today. 
There's so much confusion out there. I was thinking about that. It's really hard to pull things together. It's hard things to put things in place. Uh, you know, this whole thing about the COVID virus. And we're slowly piecing it together. And, I, you know, in a year or two, we'll probably figure out exactly what happened. But right now, it's really tough, right? But, but, Paul is, but Peter's saying, you need to pull your mind together so you can be ready to serve me. Be ready to move. Not necessary to flee, but maybe go tell your neighbor about Jesus. Maybe to go downtown and share with somebody that needs to know about Jesus. I don't know. You know, it's like he says, prepare your mind for action. Get ready to go. Be prepared. I said we need this. Is, I said we need to pull our thoughts together. We need to live according to biblical principles and priorities. That's Matthew 6 talks about, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We need to keep things in priorities. Disentangle ourselves from the world's hindrances. Uh, you know, the, the whole COVID thing has been a real distraction from the gospel. You know, it's been really convenient for the world to just say, well, you know, so we, we're concerned about the protests. I'm amazed, you know, I, I was watching the news. And I didn't even know anything was going on in Portland, and they've had protests for five weeks now. And I'm thinking, Portland, Oregon, I'm thinking, wow, isn't that something, you know? So here we are, and we have the very, our very government that's supposed to be supporting and protecting us, allowing those things to go on. I've got some strong feelings about that, but I'll let that go too, sorry. But anyway, my whole point in saying that is there's a lot of things happening around us. Are you prepared for action? What will it be? Where do you, is your heart ready? What if Jesus comes back tomorrow? I said, I said, um, disentangle ourselves from the world's hindrances. And conduct, and conduct life righteous, righteously and godly in view of Christ's return. You know, he says, you know, set your mind on things above. That's what he says in Colossians. Colossians 3. So, <clears throat> I, I mentioned this. So, you know, so you, you, know, you, 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 know, you know, you use a belt to tighten up your belt. I said that, uh, you know, Paul talks about this, the same word. This is, in, this is B, this is uh, to be, says, Paul uses the same word and picture when you put on the armor of God in Ephesians 6. It says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The belt of truth holds everything together, right? It holds everything together, holds everything in its place. The first thing a Roman soldier did prior to heading into battle was to put on his belt and tie up his robe so that its loose ends would not hinder his combat effectiveness. The soldier was preparing for life and death hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's a picture. You know, are you ready? That's a good question. I was thinking about, you know, when you're farming, and I think that, you know, probably Hunter can relate to this, is they'll, they'll you always talk about make sure you don't have, you're not out there running the baler with loose clothing on. They get in that, what's the little thing that's connected to your tractor? The PTO, thank you. You you know, it gets wrapped around that, and pretty soon you know you become part of the baler or part of the bale, right? That was a, that, that, I remember a kid growing up. Now, make sure you don't have any, be careful. Stay away from that. Don't get close to that, you know? Don't step in. You know, what are you thinking, you know? So, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people that have lost a leg or lost an arm or ended up, you know, now, I don't know, it's not near as critical, but the woman gets on the sewing machine, the next thing they're sewing up their fingers or sewing up their arm or sewing up their, you know. Just be careful about your loose clothing, about what you're doing with that. So you need to be, you need to watch and be careful, right? So I was telling the story, so, you know, so I've traveled a number of times in, uh, on airlines. There's no more fun in airlines, as far as I can tell. Uh, you go to, I would go to Spokane. The Spokane, they're, they're real proud. They've got this round thing that, you know, you go in, you have to, and you have to put your arms up, you know, and they and they body scan you. How, how many have ever had that happen to them? Well, there's quite a few. Huh? Look at this. I love that. And so my problem is because they make you take off your shoes, they make you take off your belt. My pants fall down, so you can't. I can't hold on to my pants. I had to put my hands up like this as they scan me. So I thought, well. So what I'm gonna do, so what I did is I got a little string and I tied the string on my pants here and tied it to a thing on the back. And so, and hold my pants up. You know, it's kind of embarrassing, you know? I know the scam pretty much shows everything anyway, right? But it's like, really? 
So, you know, so it's really funny. So I went, I've done that a couple times. I wore my little string. And they'll say, the STA guys up there will say, what is that? What is that? And it's a string to hold up my pants, you know. And, of course, you know, they're really into, you know, we don't want any racial profiling. I look like a terrorist, right, don't I? So they take the biggest fat white guy and they put him in this machine, and that's me. You know, and I love this. You know, I'm not black. I'm not an Hispanic. And so they went, well, we're going to pull this guy out because he's white. So, sorry. Anyway. So my pants fall. My, I have a belt. My pants fall down. So anyway, I put the string. So I'm just saying, a belt holds it up. Then it's a, in, 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 and in the armor of God, it's the belt of truth. Right? Well, you know, we need a belt of truth. We need some truth in today's society today. There's not a lot of that. We get a lot of half-truths and half-ideas, but not much truth. Anyway, so so our hope is in Jesus Christ. We look forward to his coming. We need to to prepare our minds for action, and we really do that. And how do we do that? We do it by keeping in God's word, by praying, by seeking fellowship with him, by looking to him, by being open to his leading so that that if he needs us to go do something, we can do that. And then finally, the last thing he says in this little section is, uh, it said, God has called us to be holy and to live holy lives. You know, and so think about this. Children inherit the nature of their parents. God is holy. Therefore, as his children, we should live holy lives. In fact, it's interesting. I mentioned this in 2 Peter. It says we are partakers of the divine nature. And when we come to Christ, God gives us his DNA. And I, t- I just said that in a general sense. I'm just saying, you know, we, we don't become gods, but we're made in his image. We're created in his image. And when he redeems us, then he gives us the capacity in his Holy Spirit that he might change us. We have a new capacity. And we have a new DNA. He gives us a new heart. And so we have a new op- opportunity to serve and live for him. Right? It's a supernatural thing. It only happens because the Holy Spirit lives in us. That's really the picture, all right? And so I, this is just to, just to complete this. I want you to think about this. When you, when you talk about holiness, it's, it talks about uh, sanct- sanctification. It talks about being set apart. God sets us, sets us apart for his service. God sets us apart that he might use us. That's what holiness is all about. But holiness is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that we're supposed to do, that we're supposed to live out in our life. A Will, William Barclay said, it was a destiny of the Jewish people to be different. Holiness means difference. The ideal of holiness of difference is separation from all other peoples in order to belong to God. And just think about this. I thought there's some good thoughts here. The kind of teaching that Paul and Peter urged links truth and life together, right? Communicates both content and lifestyle. Teaching involves urging, pointing out, commanding, setting an example, giving instructions. Christian teaching calls for the personal involvement that touches every aspect of the learner's life. We're all learners, and when we hear God's word and listen to the Holy Spirit, hear somebody preaching on the radio or on the TV set, we listen to their admonition and God speaking to our hearts, it deals with every aspect of our lives. The tensions of daily life, relationships with others, all these are the concerns on which Christian teaching is focused, living out the biblical lifestyle, being holy before God. Biblical teaching simply means bringing the insights of Scripture to bear on the daily lives of learners. By modeling, instructing, encouraging, advising, urging, exhorting, guiding, exposing, and convicting. Holiness means we are committed to a truly Christian lifestyle. And that's what God wants. He says, be you holy as I am. You are my son and daughter. Are you reflecting me? Do you look like the king's son or daughter in your life? Your lifestyle? Is it holy? Is it set apart? Are you following the biblical principles of my word? Be be holy because I am holy. We need to resemble our Father. We need to resemble our brother Jesus. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. 
So my prayer for you, right, today is that you might, your heart might be prepared. Maybe you're discouraged. I don't, you know, I thought about some real practical things like, you know, you know, now's the time we, we should be paying our bills off. We should be making sure that we don't have a lot of debt. My wife and I, we have a lot of credit card debt. So we've been trying to pay it down. So that if we need to go, we can. The problem is, you know, if you have a lot of debt, it, it binds you. You can't do certain things. Uh, what about, you know, what are, what are the things in my life that I need to really deal with? The sins I have that I've allowed to kind of just do whatever they want to do. I need to step up and deal with those. So I need to prepare my heart and mind ready for action. So, you know, there's a lot of applicable application we can look at and say, how am I doing with this? What do I need to do to prepare myself ready to go, ready to serve, ready to be his son or daughter? You know, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we just thank you. You are such a, a glorious God. We, we rejoice in your glory. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that, that not, only, not only do you invite us to to give us your mercy and grace and to save us, but you invite us to be glorified with you and, and serve you and live with you. We get to be in your kingdom. We get to be uh, priests and leaders in, your, in, your, uh, in, in the future. And we look forward to that, Lord. We, glorify, we, we want to glorify you and lift you up. We want to worship you today. We thank you that you were faithful in your word and that you were coming back. We just ask for your blessing upon us today. In Jesus' name. Amen.